For more physics related content, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 3D. In this video, I will use the TOV equation to find the maximum mass of a neutron star. The TOV equation is the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium in general relativity, and I derived it in the previous video, Stellar Physics 3C. So I recommend you watch that video if you haven't seen it yet. I've rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. So let's start off with the TOV equation. This equation is used to determine the pressure gradient throughout the star in hydrostatic equilibrium. So P is the pressure, R is the radial position, rho naught is the rest mass density, epsilon is the internal energy, so that's thermal energy per unit rest mass, M of R is the enclosed mass at a given radius, and G is the gravitational constant and C is the speed of light. This quantity here, 2gm over rc squared, is called the metric deviation, and I may refer to it as such in this video. So for a neutron star, we're going to assume a zero temperature limit and a constant density. Now neutron stars actually have a high temperature, so the zero temperature limit doesn't actually mean the temperature is zero, it means that it's low compared to the chemical potential. If you're not sure what I mean, I covered this in stellar physics 2a through 2c when I went over thermodynamics. Constant density can be interpreted in two ways. Either we can take this entire quantity, which is the rest mass density including thermal energy, to be constant, which is not a bad approximation for degenerate matter, which is another way of saying the low temperature limit, as the thermal energy will be of order the Fermi energy everywhere in the star. If you don't know what the Fermi energy is, it's not that important. We'll cover it when we go over degenerate matter in more detail but I'm just including it for those who know what the Fermi energy is. We can also interpret constant density to just mean that rho naught is constant and take epsilon here to be zero. Either way, we'll get the same result with a slightly different interpretation of the density. I'm also gonna define two quantities. The first one's gonna be X, which is gonna be the pressure divided by the energy density. And here, energy density, rho, can either mean this interpretation, or rho naught by itself. What's important is that it's constant. And I'm also going to define beta to be the metric deviation at a given radius in the star. Now in previous videos in this series, I've used beta to represent the fractional gas pressure. Now I'm using it to represent the metric deviation. I'm using the same letter because in the literature, they're generally both referred to as beta. Although sometimes the metric deviation is referred to as one over beta. So I'm just trying to stay consistent with what the literature uses. So if you've seen previous videos in this series, don't confuse beta in this video with the fractional gas pressure. Okay, so now let's substitute these two variables into the TOV equation. Since the density is constant, we have that the mass is just the volume times the density. I can plug this into beta to find that beta is proportional to r squared. So all I did here was plug this quantity here into m of r right here. Now take a look at this factor multiplying x right here. That's just equal to 3 beta c squared. Since beta is proportional to r squared, d beta dr is going to be 2 beta over r. Now I can use the chain rule to get that d by dr equals d beta dr times d by d beta. But I know what d beta dr is. It's 2 beta over r. So now I can replace d by dr with d by d beta in the TOV equation, and a bunch of things are going to cancel. First, these r's on the bottom cancel. Then I have a factor of rho c squared times beta on both sides, so they cancel. And I can rearrange this to put all the x terms on one side and all the beta terms on the other, which can then be integrated to get the following relationship between x and beta, where this capital C is just some constant. To find this constant, we're going to assume that the surface pressure is zero. Now remember, x is basically the pressure. So surface pressure equals zero means that x equals zero at r equals the radius of the star. I'm now going to define another quantity, beta bar, which is going to be beta, the metric deviation, at the surface of the star. So 2g capital M over capital RC squared. And so our surface pressure equals zero condition means that x of beta bar equals zero. 
Plugging this in, we find that c equals negative 1 half ln of 1 minus beta bar. To find this, all I did was plugged in 0 here. And so I have ln of 1 over 1, so that's ln of 1 is 0. And then ln of 1 minus beta bar plus c, that's got to equal 0, so c is the negative of this quantity evaluated at beta bar. We can now rewrite this equation knowing our constant c, and we can solve for x of beta. I'm not going to do all the algebra, it's not too difficult. And remember that p is just the energy density times x of beta. Remember that beta is proportional to r squared, so this is basically the pressure as a function of r. The central pressure, which is when r equals 0, or beta equals 0, turns out to be the following. So this is the pressure at the center of the star, but take a look at this denominator. What happens when this equals 0? The pressure will go to infinity. So how do we interpret this? When this denominator goes to 0, in order to remain in hydrostatic equilibrium, the neutron star will require an infinite amount of pressure, which means it won't be able to stay in a hydrostatic equilibrium and it will collapse to a black hole. So setting the denominator to zero and solving for beta bar, we find that a neutron star will collapse when beta bar equals eight ninths. This is rather interesting because when beta bar equals one, that means you have a black hole. So here we found that a neutron star cannot grow stably until it eventually becomes a black hole. Instead, if it gets to the point where beta equals 8 ninths, it will no longer be able to support itself and will collapse into a black hole. If you're finding this video interesting so far, please be sure to like and subscribe and share it with a few friends. Okay, now that we know this criteria, we can find the maximum mass of a neutron star, which is when 2gm over rc squared equals 8 ninths. Since we've assumed a constant density, we can rewrite the radius in terms of the mass and the density. And we're going to assume that the density is nuclear density, because the star is just made up of neutrons, and we're just going to assume that they're all completely packed together, as close as they can possibly be, so that basically the entire neutron star is one giant nucleus at nuclear density. So here, rn is the nuclear radius, so it's the radius of a neutron mn is the mass of a neutron. I've got an extra factor of 2 here because neutrons have two spin states. So you can put two neutrons right on top of each other as long as one is spin up and the other one is spin down. In reality, this is an approximation, so this factor of 2 is not really that big of a deal. So now substituting this density into the radius, I get the following expression for the metric deviation which I'm going to set to 8 ninths when the star reaches its maximum mass. I can now solve for the mass to find that the maximum mass of a neutron star is approximately 4 solar masses. More detailed models put the maximum mass around 2 to 2.5 solar masses, and the largest observed neutron star that I know of is a little over 2 solar masses. And for a while, it was thought that you couldn't have neutron stars over 2 solar masses, and there was quite a bit of debate as to whether the measurements of this particular neutron star were accurate. But today it's my understanding that astronomers are pretty much convinced that it's over two solar masses. So we were off by about a factor of two. That's still pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. After all, this was a pretty simplistic calculation. Now let's take a look at a few things that we haven't considered that would improve this estimate. One thing we haven't considered is causality. The speed of sound in the material has to be less than the speed of light. If you assume a relativistic gas with the model we've been using, that'll bring down the maximum mass to just over three solar masses. Another thing we haven't considered is there's other things that might cause instability. If you recall from the first video in this series, Physics 1A, a self-gravitating object will go unstable when the sound crossing time is approximately equal to the freefall time. So that has to be considered as well. And finally, we assume constant density, which is not a bad approximation for a neutron star, but in reality, the density will decrease with radius. And when the density is centrally condensed, it's possible that the maximum beta will occur somewhere inside the star, not at the surface of the star. So if that happens, Beta will reach 8 ninths somewhere inside the star prior to it being 8 ninths at its surface. 
It doesn't matter where beta equals 8 ninths. As long as beta equals 8 ninths somewhere, it will collapse. So here's an example for an n equals 3 polytrope profile. So here I've plotted beta and the enclosed mass as a function of radius. On the horizontal axis, I've plotted the radial position divided by the radius of the star. So this will go from 0 to 1. On the left axis, I have beta divided by beta bar. So at the surface of the star, this will equal 1. And on the right axis, I have the enclosed mass divided by the total mass. So this will go from 0 to 1 as well. So as you can see, for an n equals 3 polytrope, the maximum beta is somewhere inside the star at a radius of about maybe a little less than 0.4 of the total radius, and will enclose about 60% of the mass. And so the maximum beta is about, or is almost, twice as much as the beta at the surface of the star, as beta bar. In reality, we don't actually know the equation of state of a neutron star. This is kind of the holy grail of astrophysics. But thanks to gravitational wave detection, we're learning a lot more about it. Gravitational waves have been used to detect black hole mergers, but they can also be used to detect neutron star mergers, or neutron star black hole mergers. And when that happens, material from the neutron star is ejected into the space, and it emits a bunch of electromagnetic radiation, i.e. light, and you can look at this light and infer certain things about the state of the matter prior to the ejection. So I expect that in the near future, we're going to learn a lot more about neutron stars. If you've enjoyed this video, like and subscribe, and click the notification bell to be notified when the next video in the series comes out, where I will cover the binding energy of a star and the criteria for stability.